Joan Didion was one of the most important American writers of the 20th century. During her career, which spanned over 50 years, she published essays, novels, screenplays, and memoirs. Her writing has had a lasting influence on several generations of writers, and she's considered an icon of literary style, with her coolness and a keen eye admired by journalists, creative writers, and readers alike. She sees making sense of the world around us weaved into a narration, into a story, as a deeply human predilection. She famously says in The White Album, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. It is perhaps her insistence on the importance of narrating that is so captivating. Didion published five novels, among them Run River in 1963, A Book of Common Prayer in 1977, and The Last Thing He Wanted in 1996, interweaving them with collections of essays, such as Slouching Towards Bethlehem from 68, The White Album from 79, and more recently South and West, 2017. She also wrote reportage as well as autobiographic writing. Where I Was From was published in 2003 and The Year of Magical Thinking from 2005, which is a text dealing with the sudden death of her husband, uh, very successfully adapted to a Broadway play starring Vanessa Redgrave and Blue Nights from 2011. What is particularly interesting to me is that she puts the stamp of a Westerner and a Californian on all of her writing. I am at home in the West, says Joan Didion in one of her last publications, South and West from a Notebook. She clarifies, I am easy here in a way that I am not easy in other places. Her identification with the West and California is observable in all of her prose, which covers a variety of genres, but it is precisely because it is problematic that it proves captivating. Didion is able to say a good deal about California does not, on its own preferred terms, add up. And we believe her, because she calls herself a native daughter and proposes the many meanings of California throughout her career. Joan Didion was born in Sacramento in 1934, and her ties with California remained unbroken until in 1956 she won a prize in a competition organized by Vogue, which was a job in the magazine's New York offices. In 1968 she writes about the move rather nonchalantly. When I first saw New York, I was 20, and it was summertime, and I got off a DC-7 at the old Idlewild temporary terminal in a new dress which had seemed very smart in Sacramento, but seemed less smart already, even in the old Idlewild temporary terminal, and some instinct informed me that it would never be quite the same again. In fact, it never was. The move to New York that year affected her deeply. Soon after, she wrote her first novel, motivated by a nostalgic longing for the place of her origins. Didion recognizes the need for consolation as the main impulse behind the composition of her first novel, Run River. The plot of the novel was imagined, but the impulse that initially led me to imagine this story was real. I was a year or two out of Berkeley, working for Vogue in New York, and experiencing a yearning for California so raw that night after night, on copy paper filched from my office and the Olivetti Letera 22 I had bought in high school, I sat on one of my apartment's two chairs and set the Olivetti on the other and wrote myself a Californian river. The trigger for the novelistic process is homesickness, but what is also suggested is the idea that claiming the land by writing an element of landscape for herself is validated by personal nostalgia. Loss, in this case, is the basis for and an explanation of the creative impulse, and the novel is a way of coping with the loss. As Didion states somewhat ambiguously, it created a protective distance between me and the place I came from. When Didion writes about her losses and protects herself against their emotional impact, she loses the land again, this time in a self-protective gesture. 
After eight years in New York, Didion returned to California with her husband, John Gregory Dunn, and their daughter. And even though she traveled extensively and ventured out to write about various places, such as Miami or El Salvador, California has remained the center of gravity for both her life and her writing. Their home in Malibu became the epicenter of writerly and artistic activity. The writing couple befriended actors, musicians, directors, socialites. In a word, they melted easily into their Californian life, becoming a fixture of the California writing scene. Didion wrote the majority of her work in California, and it has always been the point of reference for all of her writing. Journalism, reportage, reviews, screenplays, short stories, and novels. And even though Didion is primarily seen as a non-fiction writer, I would say that it is fiction that allows the writer to represent her vision of California, of Californian identity, of American melancholy in an unobstructed way which is to say, not concerned primarily with a representation of a narrative progress of facts, figures, and events, but focused on a representation of the guiding idea or myth behind California's story. Didion's making home for her family in California and leaving it from time to time to see it from a distance allowed her to construct a complex, prism-like vision of the state where she was born, grew up, and later chose to live. Much of Didion's writing carries melancholic longing for the land, even when it locates pain elsewhere. It is melancholia that underlines Didion's vision of California and its character. And the reason for it is the sense of loss in its various configurations that informs California's history and identity in Didion's prose. It is a point that I discuss in detail in my study of Didion's novels. Didion calls herself a native daughter of California in the first collection of essays she published in 1976, only to undermine her own sense of belonging in the last collection, in which she returns to these ideas, where I was from, posing the pressing question, where will I be from? These two points mark the trajectory of her probing of the issue of California identity and its roots that Didion locates in the frontier. In between these extremes, Didion conducts a vigorous examination of the sense of the West, from the first novel she published, Run River, in 1963, to the last, The Last Thing He Wanted, in 1996, Didion weaves in her concern about what, in fact, it means to be Californian. Run River's protagonists are Lily McClellan and her husband. In Didion's own words, as the novel opens, Lily's husband, Everett McClellan, has just shot and killed the man with whom both Lily and his sister Martha have had affairs. Didion also comments on the pervasive atmosphere of her first novel. Much in Run River, as I believed when I was writing it, and as I read it now, some four decades later, has to do with the ways California was or is changing, the detailing of which permeates the novel with a tenacious, and as I see it now pernicious, mood of nostalgia. Martha, Lily, and Everett are representatives of the old California, which changes and passes into oblivion, giving rise to new modes of existence. Lily and Everett's son Knight expresses this change when he talks about his parents' rigidity. She and his father were going to be pretty surprised if and when they ever woke up to the fact that nobody in Sacramento anymore had even heard of the McClellans or the Knights, nor that he thought they ever would wake up. They'd just go right along dedicating their grubby goddamn camellia trees in Capitol Park to the memory of their grubby goddamn pioneers. Didion herself comments on this fragment. There are other signs of change, which, in the construct of the novel, is understood to mean decline. Didion's first novel could be seen as a melancholic examination of loss. The loss of an unshaken sense of belonging, the loss of an easily defined place to belong to, and the loss of the right to feel at home in this place. Didion's last novel, The Last Thing He Wanted, similarly features Californians as protagonists, even though they are out in the world dealing with larger affairs. 
In this political thriller, Elena McBahan, the novel's central character, becomes an arms dealer in Central America after her father's death. The phrase, repeated several times, characteristically, is the smell of jasmine, the pull of blue jacaranda petals on the sidewalk, blue so intense you could drown in it. We read it at least three times in the course of the narrative, and each instance provides a point of reference, an anchoring sensation for Elena, who might be dealing arms on an island on the Pacific, but who remains a Californian, with the character of a survival and an instinct to jettison any cargo, which occasionally means emotional baggage. This characterization of a Californian character through loss is also very clearly delineated in Didion's autobiographic writing, in terms which are very clearly reminiscent of Elena McMahon, the protagonist of her last novel. Didion also describes her own mother and older ancestors. My mother had no interest in keeping the Hill Ranch, or in fact, any California land. California, she said, was now too regulated, too taxed, too extensive. She spoke enthusiastically, on the other hand, about moving to the Australian outback. Ed Wayne, my father would say, a remonstration. I would, she would insist, reckless. Just leave California? Give it all up? In a minute, she would say, the pure strain talking, Elizabeth Scott's great-great-great-great-granddaughter. Just forget it. But it is not only loss in the social and historical sense that emerges quite clearly at the core of Didion's writing. The personal dimension of loss is represented there as well. This more intimate dimension of loss is visible especially in her more recent texts, composed as a response to personal bereavement. But also, her earlier prose is permeated by a sense of demise and deficiency. She started her career as a novelist, writing about the land of her childhood that seemed lost to her when she moved to the East Coast. All of her characters experience loss and grieve others. Run River commences with a shot that reverberates throughout the narrative, a shot that kills the protagonist's husband. At the center of Play It As It Lays, there is a loss entailed in an abortion. Both A Book of Common Prayer and Democracy mourn the loss of a child, either to history or, in a very real sense, to the cessation of biological functions. In the last novel, the protagonist of The Last Thing He Wanted loses her father and her own life. When Didion confesses, I think I write romances, one cannot take it to expect happy endings. On the contrary, her novels, much like her journalism, possess a pervasive sense of loss that lies at the foundations of her melancholy landscape of California. But the centrality of melancholic loss is not recognizable only in her novels. Didion situates loss at the core of selfhood in her autobiographical texts as well. In the text I've already referenced where I was from, she claims, me is what we think when our parents die. And she poses questions that seem to be driving her prose. Who will look out for me now? Who will remember me as I was? Who will know what happens to me now? Where will I be from? The parents' deaths break the link between the self and the place of origin. The anchoring in the land is lost, just as the past is lost. The curious future tense form of the last phrase, where will I be from, suggests a radical break with the land of birth, but also a relativity of origin, if I can be from somewhere else in the future than I am now. There is no promise of the termination of melancholy. The question, where will I be from, signals some confusion about Didion's own identification that surfaces occasionally in her prose. Two of her most moving and widely read volumes, The Year of Magical Thinking and Blue Nights, are meditations on personal losses, the former of her husband and the latter of her daughter. Yet, however intimate such memoirs seem to be, Didion still returns to the same events that she wrote about half a century earlier, this time, however, with her characteristic coolness and wry humor. We moved to New York 
where in fact I had lived before, from the time I was 21 and just out of the English department at Berkeley and starting work at Vogue. A segue so profoundly unnatural that when I was asked by the Condé Nast personnel department to name the languages in which I was fluent, I could think only of Middle English. Until I was 29 and just married, where I have lived again since 1988. Why then do I say I lived much of this time in California? Why then did I feel so sharp a sense of betrayal when I exchanged my California driver's license for one issued by New York? A profound loss, a meditation upon the nature of mourning, Didion returns to the issue of California and belonging there, asking questions that remain unanswered. These doubts, why did I feel this way, imply that the basis of the feeling of belonging to a place is not necessarily the time spent there, and that the physical separation does not generate a feeling of disloyalty as much as a symbolic act confirming one's belonging. Didion's astonishment continues. Could I seriously have construed changing my driver's license from California to New York as an experience involving severed emotional bonds? Did I seriously see it as loss? Did I truly see it as separation? She never gives answers to these queries, for there might be none. The pose problems are ones of veracity and of labeling one's experience as serious and true. In other words, she might be asking herself if what she is experiencing is only an illusion, impossible to tell apart from reality, if such a notion is applicable at all. The sense of a loss gains concreteness through the fact that it is the only factor of which one can be certain. Didion's eye speaker in her memoirs is often hesitant and ambivalent, but it is also thanks to these qualities that she is able to bring out much detail and nuance in her musing on the nature of loss and mourning. Ambivalence also applies to the relationship her characters have with California, and in turn the relationship that Didion's journalistic eye exhibits in her essays. It is a place lost in memory, constructed in numerous comparisons with the Garden of Eden that Didion and other Californian writers executed, and yet it is highly evasive. In at least one respect, California resembles Eden. It is assumed that those who absent themselves from its blessings have been banished, exiled by some perversity of heart. The perversity she mentions suggests that leaving California is abnormal. If it is done voluntarily, then it must be succeeded by forceful removal of affection. Historically, seeing California as ambivalent is justifiable. Ambiguity of historical identification is clearly recognizable on the level of official narrative. After the acquisition of California by the United States, California becomes American, yet its separateness in its status as the last frontier remains evident. Its meaning retains ambiguity, it promises land for settlement, yet it signals the closure of continental expansion. It is American with Mexican customs, Mexican history, and a Mexican-Spanish-speaking minority. It also retains its mythical character, with the 49ers, the Gold Rush, later Hollywood, and now Silicon Valley, animating people's imagination and becoming a projection of dreams on a global scale. Didion understands both California's ambiguity and mythopoetic quality better than anybody else. Didion enjoys the status of a canonical writer, which is a point made by her biographer, Tracy Doherty, in The Last Love Song. Yet, the critical input concerning her works is surprisingly meager. Critics who write about Didion notice that Didion's critical reception still proves to be quite below par. This is particularly puzzling because Didion is acknowledged as America's and California's primary analyst. Eva Sabine Zeheline names Didion as America's highly personal cultural literary historian and calls her reflection of the representation of California and the West incessant, which suggests the intensity of Didion's work and the challenges that it poses. H. Jennifer Brady makes a similar claim, stating 
Didion's writings in particular demand an act of historical imagination on the part of the reader, an understanding of the mythic heritage of Points West. Didion emerges as a demanding writer, one who exerts a particular pressure on her readers. That, however, does not explain the lack of attention that her prose has suffered from. When Zelehain proposes that Didion's writing has been pigeonholed as merely another piece of new journalism, she is pointing in the right direction. Didion has been an acclaimed journalist, and her fiction might be the victim of being wrongly perceived as less serious. Invariably, all analyses of Joan Didion's work commence with an expression of astonishment at the state of criticism. Considering that Joan Didion is often deemed the backbone of literary life in California, bewilderment at the lack of critical interest is indeed understandable. My study aims to fill this critical gap while pointing to some of the problems Didion's representations of California entail. I see the vision of California and Joan Didion's prose as an anachronistic concept, reaching back to Turner's frontier thesis, which proclaimed that it was not the East Coast, but the frontier where American identity lay. This anachronism, not given attention in any of the critical writings devoted to Didion's prose, plays an important function of informing and organizing Didion's vision of Californian history and identity. Once we see that Didion's vision of California is anchored in 19th century ideals, we can recognize the main problem – its refusal to acknowledge the role played by agents of history other than white. The same problem surfaces from the first published volume to the last. In slouching towards Bethlehem, Didion's speaker pronounces, I come from California, come from a family or a congeries of families that has always been in the Sacramento Valley. She obviously understands the problem inherent in her claim. Such a view of history casts a certain melancholia over those who participate in it. But at the same time, in this pronouncement, she claims California for herself, calling herself characteristically a native daughter. She speaks directly to the reader. If I could make you understand that, I could make you understand California. And something else besides. For Sacramento is California. And California is a place in which a boom mentality and a sense of Chekhovian loss meet in an easy suspension, in which the mind is troubled by some buried but ineradicable suspicion that things had better work here, because here, beneath that immense bleached sky, is where we run out of continent. A Turnerian vision to the core. Didion's California starts and ends with the first white settlers. From Didion's prose, one gathers that Native Americans or Mexicans never exerted any influence on the state's history or its character. Neither do the various groups – Asian Americans, Chicanos – influence California's present. The list of Didion's exclusion is long. This omission, I argue, is at the center of Didion's prose, and it animates her narratives, remaining an unstated premise. It is what Didion's prose does not say that is central to the vision of California it promotes. For Didion, it is the loss of her California, her moving to the East Coast, but also the loss of what California used to be and what it used to stand for that enables her to solidify her position as the speaker for California. Yet while she expresses her vision of California's history and identity, she avoids addressing the question of their multiracial and multiethnic character with an outstanding effort. The writer of Didion's skill cannot be dismissed as not realizing this omission. In fact, she suggests that it is a problem which can be explained by memory. Memory, that imperfect, failing faculty, serves as a unifying function when she states, for example, that there is in Los Angeles no memory everyone shares, no monument everyone knows no historical reference, as meaningful as the long sweep of the ramps where the San Diego and Santa Monica freeways intersect. A sentiment which echoes her words from 30 years before. 
the future always looks good in the golden land because no one remembers the past. Memory becomes an attribute of the land itself, and historical references lose meaning as the structures of motorways gain it and become the only secular communion Los Angeles has. Dependence on personal memory creates an ideal that cannot, by definition, be the basis of a shared sense of identity. A corresponding description of the more ideal California as that which existed at whatever past point the speaker first saw it deems it a hologram that dematerializes as I drive through it. Thus, this personal ideal, imagined through reminiscence and a willed projection of some unattainable past, becomes in Didion's prose the shared communal reference point, necessarily flawed and alienating. For all its omissions and willful forgetting, Didion's prose represents a certain ideal, as it correctly recognizes the power of the myth that California is. Didion manages to describe California in all its ambiguity and conflicted beauty.